Aloha, and welcome to Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of Grassroot Institute, and today my guest is going to charm you and intrigue you with some of the most interesting stories about Hawaii. His name is Bob Segal, and the business he's in is really telling stories and helping companies to tell their story. Bob is a professor at Hawaii Pacific University. Uh, he's also the author of three books that have sold very well, which are called The Companies We Keep, versions one one, two, and three. And in addition to that, he consults companies on telling their story. But there is a lot to tell. Hawaii, if anyone of you have been here, is a place that has a real sense of place. And the people, the companies, the buildings, everything about Hawaii has a story all over it. Uh, if you've not been in Hawaii, then I hope you'll be intrigued because what Bob has to share with you will certainly make you want to come here and check it out. But please, welcome to the program today with me, Bob Segal. Bob, thanks, thanks for, for being here today. Me. Hey, it's great to have you on board. You're going to tell us a bunch of stories, I hope. I, that's my plan. But first, tell me a little bit about the building we're in. In fact, our, our listeners and viewers may not realize that we are broadcasting from Hawaii on the island of Oahu, the main island in a building in Honolulu called the Pioneer Plaza. And this place is surrounded by history and on top of history as well. Bob, you're one of the, the people who's kind of clued me in a little bit to the history here. What's so special about Pioneer Plaza? The Pioneer Plaza building used to be a, a saloon and hotel. Okay, the well, union, that sounds appropriate. Union Bar and Saloon, I think is what it was called. Uh, I, I'm a Rotarian, and the first Rotary Club meeting in Hawaii uh, almost 100 years ago was held on this site. Is that right? Uh, the street that we front is Fort Street. Uh, a lot of people don't know that we used to have a fort. The Russians built a fort with the idea of taking over Honolulu just two blocks to, our, uh, to my right. Uh, and uh, when uh, Kamehameha the Great got wind of what they were doing, he sent his soldiers in and kicked the Russians out. <laughs> <laughs> We've been under a lot of different flags here at, at different points in time, too. We're kind of like Texas. We have a lot in common with Texas in that there regard. We, go. we were an independent uh, nation uh, for a long time, and, and we thought that we would probably be uh, allied with uh, Great Britain. Uh, our flag looks like Great Britain's flag. That's right. Uh, we, at one time, we proposed a, a treaty with Japan because uh, Kalakala went and visited Emperor Meiji and said, you know, we're both island nations. We're surrounded by powerful navies. Uh, people are looking at us uh, at, with a hungry look in their eyes, and uh, maybe we should form an alliance to protect each other. Well, how about that? And he offered Princess Kailani's That's hand right. in marriage as an incentive to sweeten the offer. That might have changed history here forever. Can you imagine if they had said yes? As she, I believe, was only nine years old at the time, mm. and the prince that they were thinking of in Japan was in his 30s. How about that? He said, I'm already engaged. Mm. But imagine that, uh, that she had gone there and had uh, Hawaiian children in the imperial family. Could they have attacked Hawaii in 1941. <laughs> now, the building in which we are in has actually been a place where royalty have, have come, including King Kalakaua. Isn't King Kalakaua was, uh, was famous for drinking in every saloon in town. Okay, including the one in this building, I <laughs> yes, take it. Yes, uh, the Union Bar and Saloon. Uh, he, he was a big patron here, but probably all of our kings and kings were. As a matter of fact, the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which was originally right. just five or six blocks away from us, was originally called the Hawaiian Hotel, but Kalakaua spent so much time drinking there that they made it the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And then uh, it closed in 1917 and Manson bought the name and he used it for his hotel that he built in Waikiki. So we have an earlier Royal Hawaiian Hotel downtown. Well, you know, not only do places have wonderful stories, but the people that you've written about have incredible stories, like the famous Duke Kahanamoku, who had gone to the Olympics and, and became known as really the ambassador of Aloha for Hawaii. Well, that ties in really well with the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, because yes. uh, the, the second son of Queen Victoria, Prince Alfred, the Duke of Edinburgh, he had ten titles, that was one of them, visited Hawaii, he was 25 years old in 1869, and Kamehameha V, who was the king at the time, was embarrassed there wasn't a decent place for him to stay except for rooms above saloons and private homes. He ended up staying with Queen Emma at the Summer Palace. Now how about that? But he was embarrassed that we didn't have a decent place for a visiting dignitary to stay, and so he encouraged the building of what became the Royal Hawaiian Hotel downtown. Now, in the same year that the Duke visited Hawaii, a baby was born, uh, just a couple blocks from where we're sitting here, uh, and that was in the home of Bernice Pauahi. 
and she suggested that the baby be named in honor of Prince Alfred, the second son of Queen Victoria. How about that? And they, the name they picked was Duke Kahanamoku. Now that was Duke's father, and Duke named his son thirty-nine years later. After this, excuse Ooh. me, twenty-nine years later, Duke also. So Duke Kahanamoku was actually named for the Duke of Edinburgh, who visited Hawaii in eighteen sixty-nine. Now the woman who suggested the name, you say. Bernice Pauahi was a princess and eventually the heir of the Kamehameha lands, but she married a man for whom we have a street named here, right in, in the next to where we are, Bishop Street. Yes, Charles Reed Bishop was 26 and she was 16. What a romance that was. Uh, today, uh, you wouldn't be allowed to get near a 16-year-old girl if you were 26 years old, uh, but he called on her every mm -hmm. night at the school that she went to, which was Royal, Royal school, school, on the grounds of Iolani Palace, run by Amos and Juliet Cook, mm -hmm. and he was a gentleman in every way, Juliet Cook wrote in her uh, journal, and, and that he was worthy of her heart. Now, wasn't Bishop quite an upstanding businessman here, uh, the founder of what became First Hawaiian Bank? Yes, and, our first bank in Hawaii. And, and at one point, loaned money to the, the city, or was it the, the kingdom itself, in order to retain its solvency? Not only that, but his office was here on Fort Street, just across the street from where we are. Uh, and you know the uh, the building is a kitty corner across the street from us. It's painted white today. Uh, a friend of mine, at KHMA Architects, has the office that he used to sit in. How about uh, Charles Reed Bishop and uh, Bernice Powah? He did not have any children. They were the Hanai parents of one of Princess Ruth's uh, children, but he died before reaching the age of 18. Princess Ruth was her cousin, and the two of them conspired, if they didn't have a child, to leave their lands and their estates together for the benefit of all the children of Hawaii. And that became the, because Princess Ruth passed away 18 months before Princess Pauahi, became the Princess Pauahi at Kamehameha Schools Bishop That's State right. Trust. What history, how rich. Now you have this capacity to tell stories about things that have become commonplace for us in Hawaii. And your books contain many stories. How many companies and people do you have in, in your three volumes covered? Well, in the first book I tried to count, it's around 2,000 people and 3,000 companies oh, are mentioned incredible. in the 408 pages. Uh, it's quite but, a bit of indexing to do. But some of those are just listed in a yes, timeline uh -huh. or uh, they're, they're just mentioned casually. For instance, I was on a street corner taking a picture of the crab that hangs outside of Thomas Shiro Market. Yes. And a guy named Larry Ng walked up to me and asked me what I was doing. And I, I put his name in the book because he told me a cute story about uh, uh, the woman who was the head of the Tamashiro family and who used to give him shave ice when he was a, a little boy uh, at Kailani Elementary School. Kailani Elementary School is right across the street from Tamashiro Market. A lot of people don't know that Tamashiro Market began in Hilo and the 1946 tsunami closed it and they moved to Honolulu. Kailani Elementary School used to be part of McKinley High School, and when it outgrew its facilities, the two schools decided to become, the one school decided to become two, and the younger grade students became uh, students at Kailani Elementary. Now, you tell a story in your books about a very interesting piece of military equipment that McKinley High School acquired at a certain point. What uh, was it's that? It's a great story. I was sitting at, at a trade show. I had a booth at a trade mm -hmm. show, and the man next to me had been a principal, uh, Stan Secchi. At, Stan uh, Secchi, yes. You know Stan? Yes. At uh, McKinley High School, and he said, you know, i got a great story for you. This happens to me almost every day, I told you earlier. People come up to me and they go, oh, I have a great story for you, and <laughs> I've got a imagine. list of like 300 stories now to research. It's, you know, I, I tell my readers that, you know, I can't r write the books as fast as they can read them, but I plan on writing 10, uh, because I think I've got enough material in the pipeline to do something like that. But he said that uh, there was a uh, war bonds uh, movement the class of 43-44 right. at, at McKinley High School. Their goal was to raise $100,000. They ended up raising $360,000. That's an incredible amount of Amazing. money back in the 1940s. You know, the point that, and about equivalent of $4.5 million in today's dollars. You know, I tell parents, you know, they have so low expectations, such low expectations for their children. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell them the story of what these kids at McKinley High School did. When you're sufficiently motivated, what you can accomplish is amazing, and we should ask that of ourselves and of our children. But they raised $4.5 million. The military bought a B-24 Liberator bomber, 
with that. Yeah, when I ask incredible. people what piece of military equipment did the uh, military buy from the, the money from the kids at uh, McKinley High School, people guess a tank or flamethrower mm -hmm. or something like that, but they don't guess that it would have been a bomber. Well, that's incredible. Now, we, we have such an intimate relationship with the military here in Hawaii. And of course, one of the most cherished monuments today is USS Missouri, where, where really, effectively, the war came to an end with the surrender of Japan to the United States. Now, y there's a, a community here in Hawaii that has a very special relationship you tell a story about in your books. We have both the front of the war, which is the Arizona Memorial, uh -huh, and next right. to it is, is the USS Missouri, that, where the war ended. Uh, but there is a, sp a community in the islands, and I didn't tell you what it was, I just teased you. I don't know if you can guess what it is. But there's a community in Hawaii that has had a special relationship with an earlier USS Missouri and the current USS Missouri oh. that dates back mm -hmm. to 1907 when Teddy Roosevelt created the Great White Fleet, send them on a 42,000 mile journey around the world in 1908. Uh, they came to Lahaina, they came to Honolulu, they anchored off of Waikiki, and they were exhibiting the U.S.'s willingness to project its military might anywhere in the world and defend our allies. And uh, a man who lived in a community in the islands wrote to President Roosevelt and said, the members of our community uh, would love it if the Great White Fleet would pay their respects. Do you know what community that is? No, I don't. Kalapapa. Kalapapa, where the a colony under Father Damien was of, of, of what we called back then lepers, but Hansen's disease. Now St. Damien. St. Damien. He uh, was written up in a story on the mainland about the work he was doing, and a man who had served in uh, the Civil War, a guy named uh, uh, Brother Joseph, uh, was reading what he had done and said, you know, That's I've not been a good person in my life. I'm going to go to Hawaii and help Father Damien. And so Joseph Dutton came to Hawaii. Within three years, Father Damien passed away, and he continued his mission for another 41 years. Incredible. Now, he wrote to the governor of Hawaii, and he wrote to President Roosevelt. He said, you know, the people of Kalapapa feel forgotten. They feel like we're not, uh, uh, the U.S. is not aware of us, does not care about us. It would mean so much to the people of Kalapapa if the Great White Fleet would pay its respects. So they steamed past the colony that about a mile offshore. They blew their whistles and their horns. They lowered their flags. Uh, and ever since then, uh, the USS Missouri has done similar things with the people of Kalapapa. That's just incredible. And when it was being towed from Bremerton, Washington mm -hmm. to Hawaii for its final uh, mooring, it was towed past the Kalapapa Peninsula and it fla its flags were lowered, its uh, whistles and horns were blown, and the people of Kalapapa, Kalapapa came out to pay their respects to the ship. Now, in World War II, isn't it the case that the USS Missouri experienced only one casualty? And what, what was unusual about well, that? It, it, it's a very interesting story. The, the ship was christened by Margaret Truman mm. in the naval shipyards in Brooklyn. It uh, did not see battle till 1944. So it's interesting to me that it became the place where the uh, armistice was signed. Right. And, and why it, is that? Well, because the president, Truman, was from Missouri. <laughs> there so you go. politics. That's right. Just like today, the president of the United States is from Hawaii, mm -hmm. one of the favorite sons, so to speak. Yeah, so, a, a, but during the Battle of Okinawa in 1944, a kamikaze pilot uh, w actually was photographed a, in his approach to the ship. He hit the railing. The, the, the dent in the railing has never been repaired. The ship crashed on the deck of the, sh uh, of the Missouri. It landed upside down, and it looked like the tire said Firestone. We actually think it said Bridgestone, and the first part had been <laughs> lost. Bridgestone is a Japanese tire maker, but at the time they thought maybe that our, they had bought our tires when you using a, them against us to fight the war. The crew wanted to throw the body in the plane off the, the ship immediately. The pilot said, no, we're going to give him a full military funeral because he fought valiantly and he died bravely. And so the next day they gave him, I, I don't know, a several gun salute. I have a photograph of that event as well, and he was given a military funeral. The only battle casualty aboard the USS Missouri in its history. Incredible. Now, now, before we leave telling stories about this place here, Pioneer Plaza, as you mentioned earlier, we're located on Fort Street, Fort Street Mall, really. Mm -hmm. Up a little bit on Fort Street Mall in 1879, we had the library, the first public library here in Hawaii. 
And, and you tell an interesting story in, in your, your book about the reading room, and as well as who's, who was allowed in and who wasn't. Yes, it's, it's really interesting to me that a lot of organizations have drifted quite a bit from their earlier missions. Uh, to tell you two others, for instance, the YMCA did not believe in serious exercise for its first 25 years. <laughs> it wasn't until a young man from Hawaii went to their annual conference in Massachusetts and said, we ought to be about body in addition to mind sure. and spirit. And he convinced them. And at the time, we thought Hawaii was too hot for serious exercise, probably because we were wearing too many clothes. <laughs> you know, about the that? gentlemen wore coats and ties and things like that. And today, we're, we're the state that has some of the healthiest people around. Yeah, I wanna, we're going to come back right after a short break, and you can tell us about the first public library. But obviously, uh, listening to this man tell stories is like sipping a, a water from a fire hydrant with a straw. I'm <laughs> just <laughs> overwhelmed with, with Bob Segal's wealth of knowledge. And uh, certainly, if you're going to have a cocktail party, you've got to invite Bob. He'll be the entertainment of the night. Well, you're listening to or watching as well a Hanakako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kaylee Iakina, and we will be right back after this. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone Program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. <laughs> Well, obviously, uh, you're, we're coming back in the midst of laughter. Uh, I'm Kaylee Aquino with the Grassroot Institute, and it is a delight today on Ehanakako to be interviewing Bob Segal. I mean, he's nonstop full of knowledge, trivia, fact, and, and interesting lore about places and people all over Hawaii. He's the author of The Companies We Keep, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, teaches at Hawaii Pacific University, and is never at rest. More and more stories will be coming out. We'll, we'll come back in a moment. Well, right now, Bob, let's start back where we've left off. Okay. We were talking about the public I'm library. I was talking about how several company or nonprofits okay. have drifted quite a bit from where they originally started. And yeah. the, the library mm -hmm. was for working men only. Women and children were not allowed. Is that in the right? First okay. library. And, and that makes sense at that time, in 1879. Well, it, it was an alternative to bars and saloons, oh, which okay. is what whalers had. So it was an outreach to wayward yes. men. <laughs> yes, there, there were all, you know, whaling was huge in those days. We had all kinds of ships in Hawaii. This is before oil was discovered in Pennsylvania, which decimated our whaling industry, but also gave the opportunity for our sugar industry to take off. Uh, but for a week, they did not allow women and children in, and Bernice Pauahi was on the board of directors, Queen Kapiolani was on the board of directors. They couldn't go into the library, the reading room. These were exceedingly well-educated women. And there was an article in the commercial advertiser, which was the predecessor of today's star mm -hmm. advertiser, and they said, you know, this is atrocious that you're not letting women and children in. Alexander Joy Cartwright, the father of baseball, lived in Hawaii, and he was on their board, and he said, it is a travesty that we're not letting women and children. They were, they were afraid prostitutes might come in. But uh, that did not turn out to be the case. Now, the other thing, the third organization that I mentioned is the Hawaiian Humane Society, and they did take care of women and children until the 30s, as a matter of fact. They took care of cruelty to any person or animal, mostly horses, occasionally dogs, other work animals. It really wasn't dogs and cats, you know, work, uh, you know pets until recently, but uh, they took care of women and children and they spun off their work with children in 1935 to an organization we now call Child and Family Service. That's an incredible story. So the Humane Society was really about being humane to humanity. Mm -hmm. Well, how about that? And I'm, I'm writing a story about them in the Star Advertiser in the next month. I'm trying to pin down where the term poi dog came from and popoki, which is Hawaiian for cat. And popoki, we're pretty sure, came from the missionaries petting their cats, sitting on their laps, going, poor pussy, poor pussy. And in Hawaiian, there is no S. Sure. And so, so they were okay. hearing that as popoki, popoki. How about that? And so we think popoki comes from that term. Poi dog, several of my sources and, and the Hawaiian Humane Society's book says that dogs were fed poi, but I've had historians come forward and say poi was considered sacred and would not have been fed mm. to, to dogs. 
So I'm still trying to figure out where poi dogs came from. If any of the viewers out there know, please send me an email and let me know. Now, I'm sure you have many stories that have to deal with or reveal some linguistic uh, uh, turns, such as the ones you mentioned there, and maybe translating from Hawaiian to English or transliterating the sound the way we say Melikalikimaka mm -hmm. rather than Merry sure. Christmas. One of the most interesting ones, I think, is pigeon. Pigeon, yes. Pigeon. Our Creole language here in Hawaii. We have a language here in Hawaii that we call pigeon, which is kind of a, a way for people from different nationalities and different cultures to be able to communicate on the plantation with each other. How did pigeon get started here in Pi Hawaii? Pigeon, well, pigeon got started in China. The, and the term okay. pigeon is a misunderstanding on the Chinese part of an English word. And what's that word? Business. Business. Pigeon. I can they see were that. hearing business English as pigeon English. Interesting. So the term save face, for instance, uh -huh. is a pigeon expression that says so many things. It might take me a paragraph to mm -hmm. explain what saving face was all about. But everybody came to understand the 700 words and phrases in English and Chinese and Dutch. It's sort of like today when you pick up a little Berlitz package or something and to learn business French, business Japanese. There's a, a certain vocabulary. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that's what the pidgin language originally was. Yeah, uh, Incredible. In, in, Hawaiian, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Hawaii, we had different ethnic groups come to work mm -hmm. on the plantations. The, let's say the first were the Chinese. Uh, but then there was a Chinese Exclusion Act that was passed by Congress that made it difficult right. for them to come here. And so they turned to Portuguese and to Japanese and then Filipino. And so all these groups found themselves working next to each other, and they needed to figure out a way of communicating How with about each other. That? And that's where pigeon developed. Well, this kind of reminds me uh, of something that is dear and sacred to all of us who love to eat in Chinatown, and that, that's what we call the manapua, mm -hmm. you know, the bao. We, my, my ancestors are Hawaiian and Chinese, mm. and the Hawaiians called it mea onopua'a, something delicious with pig, mm -hmm. and everybody else called it mea onopua'a quickly. Manapua. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are, haven't come to Hawaii yet, I want to put in a plug for Hawaii as a visitor destination. You have to come and eat Manapua. You know, Hawaii. I made a list recently <laughs> of, of all the foods that are distinctive to Hawaii, things that we value here, and, and you know, you've got to try if you right. come here. I have over 50 on the list. Let's I, talk about food then. Okay. Tell me uh, about a few of those items on your list of 50. Well, I'd say a plate lunch. All right, plate lunch. What's on, the story of plate lunch? Uh, plate lunch is a Hawaiian uh, term that we have that usually has an entree, two scoops of uh, white rice, right. and macaroni salad. There you go. Do you know where macaroni salad came from? No. Who, who gave that as the salad? Macaroni salad was a huge hit in New York in about New York. 100 years ago okay. at the Delmonico restaurant. In, on the lower Manhattan. Who and a that? lot of the chefs from New York ended up coming to Hawaii and they brought this treat that was popular at the time when they came to work at the Moana and the Royal Hawaiian, which opened in 1927 and other big hotels. And uh, the interest in macaroni salad died everywhere but Hawaii <laughs> because it seems to be the trifecta on the plate lunch. It goes so well with a, with a couple scoops of rice, an entree such as you know barbecued chicken or some sort of marinated yes, beef that's right. or fish, uh, and it, it cools things down at the same time. And and, and half the macaroni, uh, elbow macaroni sold in the United States is sold in Hawaii. Mm, how about that? And doesn't the, the plate lunch represent the coming together of many cultures, such as on the plantation? Yes. The Portuguese or the Japanese or the Chinese would bring their entree. Someone would bring the rice, mm -hmm. and, it, and it would create an international plate. Probably grew out of bentos. There you go. Which was a lunch that you would take to the field with you. And instead of macaroni salad, we believe people had pickled vegetables mm -hmm. of some sort. Well, you know, it's kind of a tradition here for those of us who live in Hawaii when our visitor friends come to take them to a, pr a rundown place and eat a cheap plate <laughs> lunch and, and treat that as if this is a cultural delicacy. And they <laughs> usually love it too. They Absolutely. go, where are you taking me? <laughs> oh, this food is unbelievable. It's incredible. And Sp spam is one of the other oh, things. Oh, spam, that yes. Tell us the Hawaii. story of spam. Well, spam, <laughs> uh, we're not sure exactly what it means. The person who created the term, that brainstormed the mm -hmm. term, uh, says he got it out of nowhere, but the original product was shoulder of pork and ham. Is that right? I thought it was uh, spiced artificial meat. <laughs> <laughs> spiced ham is uh -huh. another uh, way of calling it. 
And uh, so we're pretty sure that it was a derivation of one of those two. Now, it, it, Hawaii's love affair with spam, and we truly do have a love affair with spam. I think we eat more per capita than anywhere else mm -hmm. in the world. It began in World War II, didn't it? How yes. did that happen? Well, and, and maybe even before World War mm -hmm. II, when during the Depression, people were very poor, and they were really eating out of cans. And so you could buy you know, a can of, of uh, spam for probably 10 cents in the Depression. Now, wouldn't it be the case that in many places across the country, spam is a cheap version and an inferior version of steak or meat, where people ate a lot of meat, but, but here in Hawaii, where we just use this as a garnish, it was a delicacy. And it's become comfort food. You yes. know, it's like macaroni and cheese, you know, for people in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. There you, know, you go. It, it is, you know, when you're brought back to your childhood in Hawaii, if you're someone my age, uh, you think of Spam. Uh, so one of the garnishes that we would put it on would be Saimin. Yes, which that's is, right. Which is like ramen, mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that's fairly unique to Hawaii. Became very popular at the old Honolulu Stadium on Eisenberg and King Streets during the 20s and so how 30s. How about that? Now, now Saimin, isn't it these ramen noodles and some kind of broth with a little bit of garnish and Spam on top? And the reason I'm saying that is, for, again, for our friends who haven't visited the islands, you have to come here and go to McDonald's and order your Simon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, you know, uh, what was the, uh, the um, I'm blanking out the name of the founder of McDonald's. Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc went to Boulevard Simon. Is that right? Which is now Dillingham Ray Kroc came to Hawaii. Came to Hawaii to check out Simon so that they could okay it for the menu here. Is that right? And they right? went to Washington Simon and Boulevard Simon, <laughs> which is now Dillingham Simon, right. and Tanaka Simon. Mm -hmm. The two sisters have split up. And uh, tried it, and then a month later it was on the menu at the McDonald's here in Hawaii. Incredible. Do you think that has anything to do with the fact that the Salvation Army was able to win the Kroc grant from Ray Kroc's win widow to start that service that center here? I think that was, uh, th this was probably 30 years ago that mm -hmm. Simon got, got on the menu. But, but he it might have it, fallen in love it, with Hawaii. But yes, I think it did. <laughs> you know, so many people have come to Hawaii and fallen in love with it, like Frank Sinatra, for instance. Oh, yes. Tell us about uh, Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra, when he uh, became a little bit older and his fans were no longer teenagers, mm -hmm. they kind of turned away from him and, and he became a has-been. And so he banked his career on a, on a comeback in the movies from Here to Eternity, uh, filmed mostly That's at right. Schofield Barracks. Mm -hmm. And uh, he offered to do the role for under $10,000, where he would have been paid maybe a quarter of a million. He argued they did not want to let him have the role of Maggio in, in that movie. Uh, but he took the role, and he ended up winning a, a, an Oscar How about that? for it. Uh, later on, he was in Magnum P.I. in his last uh, film or movie role was here in the islands mm. where he played a New York cop who was chasing a murderer all the way from New York to Hawaii, caught him at the top of a building on Bethel Street near where I teach at HPU, shot him and he fell over the, the side oh. of the building. And that he didn't know that was going to be his last role, but that was his last role in the island. You talk about Here to Eternity, which starred Burt Lancaster, didn't it? Yes, he was the sergeant. And, and if anybody goes up there to uh, to uh, Schofield Barracks, the, the buildings are almost identical. And, and haven't they kept some of the the, the markings and damage from from uh, the uh, bullets shot at it by yes, Japanese, and Japanese and zeroes and Hickam well, Air Force as well? Yeah, they, they haven't fixed some of these things up. Schofield Barracks mm -hmm. has an interesting story because a fort is designed to protect itself. Schofield is not a fort, it's a barracks. It houses troops that protect somewhere else. What is that somewhere else? Tell me. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. We were afraid that uh, an enemy would land on the North Shore, march down central Oahu, and attack Pearl Harbor from the rear. And so we built Schofield Barracks in the middle of central Oahu to protect Pearl Harbor. How about that? And that was in the days before the interstate highway system. <laughs> yes, it used to be out in the middle of nowhere. There used to be all kinds of gulches and ravines you had to drive up and down and up mm. and down and up and down. A group of California settlers opened up the town of Wahiwa next to it around, the, let's say, 1898 or so. Well, you've, you talked about the chairman, uh, Frank Sinatra. How about the king, Elvis Presley? I'm sure you have a lot to Elvis say about Elvis Presley him. fell in love with Hawaii as well. Uh, but do you know why he came to Hawaii for the first time? Was it to film one of the, the movies? No, Blue he, Hawaii? he received 28,000 of something in the mail. What could in that December be? of 1955 or 56, and that convinced him that there was a, a sizable enough audience to come put on a show here. Twenty-eight thousand. What could that be? Uh, couldn't be telephone calls on Dancing with the Stars. No, no. probably not. <laughs> <laughs> not text messages.
Christmas cards. Christmas cards. He got 28,000 Christmas cards. Now, Tom Moffat mm -hmm. was famous for giving yes. out the addresses of people. He denies that Young he did this. Young Tom Moffat at but the time. But I suspect that, mm -hmm. you know, he did. He was a DJ at k Poi Radio at the time. I suspect he may have orchestrated this, but every time I talk to him and ask him about it, he says he didn't play a role in that. But he was a, the promoter for Elvis when he did come here. He put on three shows at the old Honolulu Stadium, which I mentioned was famous for popularizing Simon. Well, that's Tickets incredible. were $2, 250 and $3. I have friends that, that went to those shows. And I, El, another thing that people don't know is that Elvis Presley helped fund the building of the Arizona Memorial. It needed about half a million dollars mm -hmm. to build at the time in the 60s. Oh. And he promised that he would come put on a concert here when he got out of the military. His first concert when he, when he got out of being a soldier was here in Hawaii. It was at Block Arena at Pearl Harbor. It raised $48,000. He was 5000 short of his goal, so he wrote a check. That's incredible. Well, we'll come right back uh, in a moment. Uh, we're talking with Bob Segal, some fascinating stories. But they're not just stories that entertain. Bob is actually practicing an art, uh, an art in which he's one of Hawaii's leading consultants, the art of helping companies tell their story. When we come back after this break, I want to talk with Bob a little bit about that methodology of doing business by telling stories. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. You're watching Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We'll be right back after this. I'm Bill Spencer, President of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association. We do monthly luncheon programs with ThinkTech about things that matter to Hawaii entrepreneurs, investors, and business service providers. So join us on the fourth Thursday of every month at the Plaza Club. For information about upcoming events or to join our mailing list, visit hvca.org. See you there. easy to do when it's a lot of fun. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute, but before going on I want to say thanks to Jay Fidel, producer generalissimo in charge of the entire network. Sitting right over this direction. And, and I want to include yeah, him in the absolutely. conversation. Absolutely. We're occasion. going to wave to Jay over there <laughs> because he's behind the scenes, behind the cameras, and you can find him on thinktechhawaii.com. And what you'll find there is a library of programs with the most fascinating people, uh, stories about Hawaii for the world, so I hope you'll patronize the site. My guest today, Bob Skull, is a master storyteller. He knows the behind the scenes of people and places. I bet he's got a lot of dirt on some contemporary leaders as well, and <laughs> maybe that's how he funds his business. But the, the truth is... Blackmail. <laughs> there you go. The truth is, uh, every single square inch of Hawaii is rich with stories. It really is, and Bob has been telling them. But we're going to talk a little bit more about the power of storytelling, and so I welcome back Bob. Bob, this has been a fascinating program. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I, I'm just amazed that Hawaii has so many great stories it sure that the does. public largely doesn't know That's right. about well-known people, places, and companies that we all know. In fact, it's almost as if these stories are a rich treasure trove that can be used by anyone for marketing or for any other purpose, but we tend not to take advantage of it enough. You know, um, I think part of the reason my book has been successful is that companies today are so busy telling you what's on special this week <laughs> that they kind of have lost sight of their interesting history. So we don't really tell the whole context of a company and, and, and give the reason somebody would uh, want to fall in love with that company and identify with it. Instead, we're just trying to market the latest thing. You know, if you tell your story well, you, have, uh, you endear yourself to your customers. You know, they've got so many competitors that they can choose from, like, for instance, the case of City Mill. They've got, you know, Lowe's and they've got Home Depot sure. right next to them. Mm -hmm. Why choose them? Well, you know, I think that they've got a great story. You know, for instance, uh, they, they're over 114 years right. old. Mm -hmm. uh, the founder, uh, CKIE, went to school with Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who became the president of China. That's right. uh, it originally was a lumber mill and a rice mill, and they've got one of the original rice mills in their parking lot at Nimitz Highway. How about that? You know what they need to do? They need to hire you as a consultant, which they may have done already, and open a museum in their f a foyer so that people can come in and experience. Actually, they, all, they almost Hawaii. have that. They're, there you go. They're, I think one of the best companies uh -huh. at telling their story, and on their Nimitz store, they've got a wall of photos that talk about there their you history. Have it. So, for instance, they've got a picture of the Vigilant, which is a ship that they mm -hmm. built 
we used to have something in Hawaii called the Big Five, which kind of had a monopoly on shipping in Hawaii. And uh, to get around that and lower their own prices, they built their own ship, which would hold two million board feet of lumber. So City Mill built the fastest five-masted schooner in the Pacific in the 30s. Wow, what a piece of heritage. And, and you know, uh, that would be a reason just to go into the store uh, to experience some of that ambiance. So what you're saying is that companies and individuals, uh, businesses, schools, even the whole state are not taking advantage of the stories that are present. Now, how do you translate story into something that actually markets a place? Well, you know, I think that to some extent is we're too close to ourselves to have any perspective. I like to tell, have my students, for instance, and my clients say, if this is me and this is my business, what is our relationship? And I think it's more like this. We're so close to what we're doing, it's, we've lost perspective on it. So one of the things we need to do is stand back, or even better yet, see how people other than ourselves look at us. Do, do you think this is something that can be applied to marketing the state of Hawaii? Absolutely. You know, we, we've lost track of, you know, what makes us so special. You know, it, it's only when I visit other places that I realize, you know, there, there is more to do in Hawaii than you could do in 15 or 20 trips. I went to the Bahamas in, a while ago and there wasn't, there was hardly anything to do there. You know, there's golf and there's the beaches and there's casinos, but there's hardly anything else. And in Hawaii I made a list of places you might want to go and, and, and see and things to do and it's over 150 things. If you could do 10 a trip, that's 15 visits that it might take you. Uh, we are not great at telling a complex story, that's part of our problem. You know, we show people Hawaiian music and we showed people Diamond Head and Pearl Harbor and there's really so much more to Hawaii than that. So there are these elements of what makes Hawaii wonderful. There's the scenery, there's the geography, there are the people and so forth. But a story would probably tie it all together and give context and meaning. Yeah, I look at a story like a book. Okay. You need a hero. Okay, there you go. You know, and so the, it's a narrative. The hero might be a person or it might be a signature item on their menu or it might be uh, you know, a product that they have is the hero. Uh, for instance, I'm working with Charlie's Taxi at the moment. They're Hawaii's oldest taxi oh, company. Oh. Elvis made them popular, you know, uh, a long time ago when he rode in some of their cabs. But they, uh, they have technology that is more modern than any other taxi cab company in Hawaii. They know where every cab is at every moment for the last year. If, if the drove, driver went out of his way to hike your fare, they can go back and check it, and if that's the case, they can issue you a refund. If you forget something in the cab, they can find it and get it to you so much quicker because they've got this $800,000 piece of equipment. And I've been telling them that this is the, the story element that they should be telling. Aren't there some interesting twists to that story? For example, at one point they, they rivaled and perhaps surpassed the Honolulu Police Department in, the, in their communication technology. Uh, yes, that's true. Well, that's something. And, and so where do we discover the stories for our co companies. You know what I what I do when I'm working with companies mm -hmm. is we start brainstorming a list of their okay. story elements. So we might talk about Charlie Morita, for instance, and his wife Helen, and we might talk about other generations and what they have done with the company. We might talk about interesting stories. For instance, Danny Kalekini, right. one of Hawaii's most famous singers, uh, got his start at a weekend jam session at a Charlie's Taxi Cab stand. Fascinating. He would show up there. He was a high school student, and he got so many tips and so much applause that he was encouraged to follow a professional career. Mm -hmm. Now, the o owner president of Charlie's uh, Taxi, Dale Evans, is yes. someone whom you, both of us know, yes. and she's been given awards by small, Smart Business Hawaii and so forth. Uh, do, do you think that uh, these stories would actually increase the bottom line in business if people could understand them? Sure. Because why, why is that? You know, uh, there, is, there is so much information coming out to people. Mm -hmm. I think people have to be able to make their story very simple very compelling, very appealing. They have to find out what the things are that resonate the most with their customers. So I believe in market research. You know, once we've got a list of story elements, I want to bounce them off our current customers to find out which ones motivated them to choose us today. Now, yes, you've got a, a certain formula, I think. I've seen you do a little workshop that could take a company, perhaps in a, an afternoon, through the process yes. of brainstorming and so forth. What are the basic elements of that process of coming to terms with your story and then using it? Well, you need uh, a hero, like I mentioned. Okay, you a hero. need story elements. You need a motive. That's one of the elements I haven't mentioned yet. You know, what, what was your founder's motivation? 
you know, why did they do what they do? So, for instance, Casey Driven, one of our famous yes. drive-ins here in Hawaii, uh, was founded by a stockbroker and a real estate agent in 1929. And in 1933, after the Depression started, they turned to their cook and said, why don't you buy the restaurant from us? And he said, how much? $100. He didn't have $100. Jiro Asanto was his name. And so they made a deal with him, $10 a month for 10 months. <laughs> and he ended up buying the restaurant. And everybody called him Casey there for Knapp and Christensen, the founders. <laughs> and he, he changed his name to Casey. He would respond to Casey. Well, incredible. Now we've got a, a whole bunch of restaurants here. Uh, let, let's, let's take one of them, just any one you can think of where, and you can do some free consultation on the air here, where, where you could start helping the, to tell their story, like maybe uh, L&L &L the Drive-In, which is, which is all over the island. L Eddie Flores. Eddie Flores is uh, the fourth owner of L&L, &L, and he did not know where the L&L &L name came from. He thought the Liliha Trolley made a loop around his building, and so L&L &L was Liliha Loop. Lee Liha Loop. You know how long I've been trying to figure out who L on the left and who L on the right was? But it's, it's Lee Liha Loop. No, it's not. He was wrong. <laughs> wrong, about okay. That. Uh, he wasn't sure that that was the case. Uh -huh. He suspected it. So I looked up the trolley maps. The Lee Liha trolley went a mile further up the street that right? from where he was yeah. before making a loop. Well, we're going to have to have some suspense now and have our viewers hang on. We've got to take a break, and we're going to come back and learn what L and L really means. Uh, this is Kili'i Akina with Ehana Kako on the Broadcast Network, Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're, we're talking with Bob Segal. We'll be right back after this. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Very well, and I enjoy doing this with you. Aloha. Welcome back to our final segment of Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Uh, again, go to thinktechhawaii.com and look at the wealth of programs on movers and shakers, interesting places and things and issues here in Hawaii and beyond. Today we're talking with Bob Segal, a master storyteller about the sense of place in Hawaii, the interesting people. He knows where uh, all the bar bodies are buried, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> uh, that won't be until my 10th book. Companies We go. Keep X will be gossip and innuendo. And then you won't be around much longer after that book. So Probably really not. Won't, won't that's why matter. I'm saving it for last. <laughs> there we go. That's wise of you. So before the break, we were talking about an institution in Hawaii, L&L &L Drive-In. Uh, Eddie Flores is a friend of both of ours. And uh, here's a piece of trivia that, that uh, you might not know. But do, you, do you know that Eddie's favorite L&L &L Drive-In? No, I don't. Tell me. It's the one in the uh, Walmart on uh, Keiomoku Street. Uh, I think it's because it's probably the cleanest one. <laughs> but tell us, L&L, &L, all over the world now, 200 plus in, in, in the United States, serving plate lunches and varieties of that. Where did the uh, name come from? What Eddie, does L&L &L mean? Eddie bought L&L &L Drive-In. It already had that right. name for his mother who said, I'm bored, right. I need something to do. Well, she, it, in, in his Asian tradition, she was getting along in years and he wanted to give her a present, so he gave her a store so she could work the rest of her life. Yes, and then she got tired of working. <laughs> so he brought in Johnson Kim, and the two of them became partners in taking this idea all across uh, Hawaii and now all across the world. They just opened up one in Japan, mm -hmm. I believe. But uh, originally, we had a dairy in Hawaii called the L and L Dairy. Okay, is that out in Waianae? Uh, no, no it, used, it used to be. Uh, well, it, it became the North Shore. All right. But it used to be like where Dairyman's was in the Kahala area. Okay, out there. Several other locations. It was our third largest dairy. We probably had dozens, maybe even a hundred dairies in Hawaii at one time. 
But uh, L and L was Lee and Lee. A guy Lee named Bob Lee. Lee Senior had named it for he and his father, who died when he was only five years old in Korea. He came to Hawaii, created L and L Enterprises. They bought a dairy uh, when uh, when the father, the, the man who owned the dairy, died, and the, the wife couldn't afford to keep running it. And so they took it over and named it the L and L Dairy. It had a milk that was slightly higher in butter fat than other milks on Oahu, and had a special following. Well, they opened up a milk depot in the Le Leha area where you could drive up, somebody would run out, take your order for milk and butter and cheese and juice and eggs and things like that, go in and get it and bring it out to your car. You'd sit in your car. And they call, uh, it was a milk depot, and then it became a soda fountain. After uh, Bob Lee sold it uh, to the Hirayama brothers, they kept the L&L &L name because of the following that the milk had, turned into the L&L &L, uh, Dairy Lee Leha Fountain, and that evolved into the L&L &L restaurant chain that we have today. How about that? So milkshakes we have something to do with the story which ties it into the story of Ray Kroc and the founding of McDonald's <laughs> in a lot of ways. Right, yeah. And if we tell that story maybe there's a little more bang for the buck. How do individuals take advantage of storytelling. For example, our mutual friend Jay Fidel, who's spent a good part of his life and mm -hmm. career as a lawyer, who now devotes himself to this broadcast network. And what if he wants to market himself? How does, how does story work you, into you that? You need to know what it is that makes people tune into your shows, listen to your podcasts, buy your products and services. And you can't watch them and see what that is. You, and you can't say, I know what it is for me, it must be the same thing for them. What motivates them might be different. Uh, you know, so for instance, I almost always will do market research to find the answer to this because the answer is not in the mind of the owner of the company. I did a, a survey with um, Lex Brody's Tire Company right. in the last five Lex, years. Right, what a grand man. And the, um, I asked the general manager who'd been there 18 years at the time to predict what people would say, the marketing manager, the office manager, and her assistant to predict what, what we would learn from 200 uh, people, 200 customers, about why they chose us. And we found out the closest person was the person who had been there the least amount of time, the assistant to the, market, to the office manager. The general manager was the furthest away because he was so close to what he was doing that he had lost perspective on it. You know, anything that you do closely, you lose perspective on. That's why market research is so valuable. And I like to ask questions like, why did you choose us? What, do you, what would you tell people about us? Why do you stay with us? What are we doing right? What are our strengths? Those kinds of things give us an idea of what the bullseye is that we, we've hit. You know, and in sales, you know, you often will sit opposite someone, you give them a message, you can see if they sit up or whether they kind of look bored. You know, so you get good at delivering messages. But in marketing, you might have a pamphlet or a, an ad on the internet or a radio piece, and, and they don't necessarily read it when you're in the room with them. So you don't necessarily see what they're responding to. And that's why market research can cheaply and quickly point out what that is. So when we've done our market research and we understand a little, little bit more about how people perceive us, about what people are expecting, about what they're interested in. Now, how do we move to the next step of tying our story Well, we into need that? to look at all the promotion materials and whether they're delivering that message. We often find that they're delivering not the primary message, but maybe the seventh message. Or we look at the messages in our ads. You know, in Lex Brody's case, we listed 26 messages that we could see on all of their promotional materials, ads, and websites. You know, and I would say that that's too many. I was working with a property developer in Makiki, and he was excited about two elements of his new project that he was developing. But when we surveyed the general population who might be buying those condos, they were down in the bottom you know, of the list, not at the top. And the items that he was excited about were not the items that they were excited about. Now, isn't it true that when we're given as human beings lists, we're challenged to remember what they are, if like 1 through 50. But if we sit down and watch a movie, for example, we can come out and tell the entire storyline of that mm -hmm. movie. Do you think, is that something behind the Storytelling has, story? has a lot to do with it. It's not just bullet points. Mm -hmm. It's how you tell your story. It's you know how you engage your public. Mm -hmm. it, it is simplifying your message. You know, a movie, you know, if, if I were to tell you everything that happened in a movie I saw this weekend, it would take me two hours to repeat it. But I'm telling it to you in about a minute or maybe even five seconds. And, and people have trouble. For instance, if I ask the typical business owner to tell me about their business in five minutes, they have no problem doing it. If I then say, tell me about your business in five words, uh, but, 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 you know, that's when it becomes a problem. Well, let's go back to the example you were just using when we were talking about knowing our market uh, and the mind of the people in our market, about 
telling our story in a way that mm -hmm. is compelling. Let's go back to the example of Lex Brody, okay. Lex Brody tires mm -hmm. and so forth. And everybody can remember him as always saying, thank you very much. What is the story then that, that would be good for Lex Brody? Well, you know, a lot of people don't know Lex's stories. Uh, and, you know, where thank you very much came from is a cute story. You want to hear it? Sure. He made decals of his cavemen. They called right. him Little Joe. The caveman is a wooden device about this big that has a mechanical arm that moves. It, it's exactly the way it looks today, except instead of having him work on just one tire, it's a cart, like a Flintstone cart, that has four tires and a roof and everything. And he, they made a decal of that. They called him Little Joe. They put him on cars if the owner said it was okay, or their customers. One day, an eight-year-old boy came in and asked for one. Lex gave it to him. The boy didn't say anything. And Lex says, what do you say when somebody gives you something? Silence. His mother's nudging him, say thank you, say thank you. Silence. Lex says, you know, he should say thank you very much. And then he realized, we're probably not doing a great job of teaching our children civility and appreciation. What a story. And he decided to thank his customers for watching his commercials. So he started saying thank you very much at the end of his commercials, thanking you for watching his commercials. And, that became, and it became famous as soon as he started doing absolutely. it. Absolutely, it became iconic. And, and the story continued that in his retirement, he ran for the Board of Education because he was so concerned about education and manners of our young people. Thank you very much. He was the top vote-getter vote in the state of Hawaii. He received more votes than the governor. Incredible. So tapping into that story of teaching children how to say thank you is a powerful way of bringing people into the ambiance of Lex Brody. Now I worked with, with their people to, uh, recently and we created an award that we give to school kids for thanking somebody we pick one every month. We have them write a letter of appreciation. The teachers send them all to us. We pick one and we honor them. We give them all kinds of gifts. It's well, this called is the Thank You Very Much Award. Well, there's only one thing left in this program to do with the time we have. And that's it's a good to time say, to say thank wow. you. Thank you very much, Bob Segal. <laughs> My pleasure. This has just been absolutely fascinating. And uh, I, I think that anyone who's been watching or listening today uh, I bet you're as enriched as I am in learning a little bit about Hawaii if you're not from the islands come here uh, look up some of the places uh, maybe take a look at Bo one of Bob's books the companies we keep and use that as a travel guide uh, that would be an amazing journey around Hawaii Hawaii is a place rich in stories its people and its places have tales to tell and I want to invite everyone in the world to come here come here do business here come here enjoy the people here and we'll extend to you the aloha spirit. Bob Segal has been a great tour guide to the stories of Hawaii. I'm Kelee Akina with the Grassroot Institute saying mahalo to all of you. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Ehana Kako. Let's work together. Aloha. Aloha.